And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a newcomer to the temple, a longtime veteran of the of the of the world of of the world of dice, mit dice, minis, and books. Dear God, so many books, <laughs> and the and most recently the the ma the mastermind behind the behind the five E um, module and set setting Beowulf: Age of Heroes, the one and only John Hodgson. How you how you doing today, man? I am pretty good. Yes, I need to up my energy levels considerably to meet <laughs> to meet that introduction. Uh, but yeah, I am really good, and thank you for having me here. It's very nice to be here. Yeah, d yeah, it is a lot of books, isn't it? Every now and then, I have to move all my comp copies of things, and I think, wow, <laughs> that's quite a lot of things you did. Yeah, yeah, and so I'll I'll um. I'll start as I often do in these kind of things with the humble beginnings. Mm, um, sure. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what and what about it made it stick. So, like a lot of people in the UK, my very first kind of RPG adjacent thing was the fighting fantasy game books, mm. and I started with number three because it was the only one. It was a big craze in my school, tiny little village school. I would be maybe nine at the time, mm. and I could only get hold of Citadel of Chaos. So I had Citadel of Chaos is where I started, uh, and that was really good. Really loved that. Not not really a proper role playing game, but sort of turned me on to that kind of thing. Then a neighbour who I believe was actually. I think the niece of Brian Froud, of all people, didn't know that at the time. She uh, lent me the kind of blue box AD and D, no, yeah, AD and D set, which I just could not make head nor tail of. I'm not sure whether it was sort of complete or it just made absolutely no sense to me, age nine, um, and I couldn't. Kind of, you know. If it was the if it if it was a blue box that that um. That that gives that gives me a couple assumptions, and because I can't actually see the box, I can't know for I can't know for certain either. A, it was one of the it was one of the really er, it was one of the really early um really early it, re renditions of O D and D. Yeah, or think... B, it was the yeah. blue box in Beck Me, which in that case, why the hell would you get why the hell would you be given that? Yeah, I think it was I think it was O, o D and D. But it just, I think I was too young really to grasp a game sort of that nature. But anyway, but then she, then I also played Talisman with her, which now maybe I wouldn't kind of have the, the time and energy to play a full game of Talisman. But as a kid, I absolutely loved it. I thought it was brilliant. Gary Chalk artwork just blew my mind. I thought it was amazing. Um, and then uh, I got the Tiger Man book for fighting fantasy which was a full rpg very mm -hmm. simple but it was a proper rpg multiplayer rpg um after that and then very quickly onto dragon warriors which was presented in the same format and again this is probably quite similar journey to a lot of people in the in the uk mm -hmm. um sort of bounced off D, D initially and then through playing dragon warriors met moved on to like high school met a load of people who were playing D, &D uh picked up D, &D there and, and as a group throughout high school we played pretty much everything i think mm -hmm. i say that we didn't play everything but do you know what i mean all the big ones we did cthulhu we did room quests we played tons of gw board games um and all that stuff and and it just i, I then moved on to um live action role play for a while in my sort of mid-teens to, to mid-twenties in about 10 years i worked professionally as a as a rubber sword maker for a long time so all this kind of thing i just i love it really mm -hmm. um I've I've always loved that sort of the let's pretend part of it and characters and stories and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, I'm sure it's similar to for a lot of people. Um, in in my own home games, we tend to skew towards more sort of freewheeling. We're we're very very bad at, at keeping track of rules and things. Um, it's been nice to pick it up again a bit mm -hmm. more in the last couple of years. I, I have a fairly regular. If I say it's a five E game, it isn't really because it's not really. We don't really use the rules half the time, but it's you know in, in broad terms. I and mean, we play, we we 
playtest and Beowulf stuff and I try mm-hmm. stuff out on them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's you know, old, old role players, I think, sometimes lose an interest in, in following the rules, maybe, and others get more into that. I'm, I'm definitely in the kind of, gosh, I'm tired and I can't keep track of um, things. <laughs> even for when it comes to when it comes to that particular divide for where i st- for i st- where i stand on the, um mm. i i was even before i got into role playing i was already ho- i was already house ruling board board and card games that i played and right. i um i had i had a run i had a running joke for years that nobody at, that um there are certain Im- there are certain impossible things that you will see like say a honest politician, a truthful lawyer, and <laughs> somebody who ha- and somebody who plays Uno as written. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because ev- because everybody I everybody I knew had some had some variant rule or some sort of house rule, and then I remember a having a version of Uno that collected a bunch of people's um, house rules for it. Right. Because was, there was big controversy recently, wasn't there, where they clarified about what certain cards mean and, and people are like nope <laughs> that ain't happening uh, yeah the whole oh. pick up two stuff yeah plus I, I i know i know some designers don't care for it but i have always been a proponent of rule zero uh-huh yeah yeah um i don't yeah i don't have a strong opinion on it but you know yeah i think it makes a lot of sense doesn't it well the that and so, something that i've learned over the years with talk, with talking with all manner of of designers of all different ages is um 99% of the time we're just making shit up. Mhm. Yep. I think so. It's just it's a bit of a help, isn't it? It's a bit just it just sort of steers the activity. Mm-hmm. Um and I think that's generally I'm of the opinion that the good good rules sort of push towards making the right tone and feel and so on at, mm-hmm. at the table. Um yeah, I was talking this morning actually about a friend maybe acquaintances more than friends i don't know them that well publish uh quite an old school rule set and gosh there's a lot to do you know there's an example of play in one of their books i won't name them because i'm not going to be super complimentary but the example of play breaks down a series of physical tasks into these tiny little blocks that are all and it almost becomes like the the world is trying to make you fail to do a cool thing and I'm like, I don't know why. Almost, I don't. It doesn't make sense to me to, to to go become so granular that because you're stacking up so many tiny little checks, tiny little rolls, you're going to fail really on aggregate almost. Because mm-hmm. um, if you were going to pass on aggregate, also why make them? And if you're going to fail on aggregate, it just seems like wow, this is an uphill struggle. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a funny one. But every, I think everyone finds their own level with that stuff don't they what they find exciting and i'm sure for some other people it's really exciting to roll for every 10 meters you run or something i'm yeah. pretty i'm pretty sure if i dig enough i will find somebody who swears by phoenix command i'm sure yeah, i'm sure yeah. that i'm sure that they're a very special bunch i bet they're... there's some people who are almost sort of like siloed do you know what i mean they have some some real I don't want to say old school because old school sort of changes meaning. Maybe I mean old fashioned rather than old school because I think there's a lot of joy and brilliant, cool stuff in like OSR stuff. Um, but uh, but really old fa- who just play rules as written of a game like Phoenix Command and they've never felt the need to do anything different. Mm-hmm. Um, I just like I just like pick on picking on Phoenix Command because it, because um, I attempted to ru- to run the first attempt at an alien rpg that used those that use that game oh rules. yeah yeah oh um, yeah and i and um there's a re and I, there's a reason why i'm not touching it again and why i was <laughs> glad to see free league um take a crack at it with a much better set of rules yeah right um, yeah there's some beautiful stuff in that game i think then, yeah there there was it but that pr- but back to more sane things. Um, yes. Now the big, the big, the big rubber stamp that you that you've had um, that you've had recently is um, Beowulf. And mm. one of the questions I want I wanted to ask is how did how did the idea of adapting Beowulf to five E rules um, first first get going? Was was this was 
was this some was this something that was a was a collect was a collaborative idea i.e peer pressure was it was it a ca was it a case of just um just having a fascination with that with um that particular that particular st style of storytelling what um prompted it yeah a bit of a bit of both of those things i think so when we first set up handiwork games we had a little team of people who mm -hmm. Who we knew were going to work together and, and we wanted to put together a role-playing game project um and all of us had worked on the one ring and adventures in middle earth stuff like that mm -hmm. um and that was really I, I had learned a lot about the the sort of background of, of tolkien's influences and so on and, and beowulf being a really big one of those so so beowulf was sort of kicking around in the background we we started out wanting to make a kind of low fantasy uh in inverted commas dark ages you know early medieval kind of setting we thought mm -hmm. there was room to do that and we knew we could do it this was the main thing was the people in the team it was an era that they really enjoyed we knew we could produce artwork and so on that, that suited that we felt we had some good ideas for some rules for that period and as we were talking about it we uh, kicked around a bunch of ideas and Beowulf just kept coming up and then quite quickly with regard to Beowulf and I've said this a few times now uh, on, on uh, when asked this question I could just check back in because it's all in, in discord logs we use discord mm -hmm. to discuss all this stuff I could check back but I prefer to just leave this as a, as a sort of mysterious thing I don't know exactly when it came up the idea of one GM and one player yeah I don't know um, who... duets <laughs> Yeah, duet play. I don't know who, who was the first person within that team to sort of moot that idea that what if we did this, you know, as, as a, a the sort of killer app, if you like, the, the real unique selling point could be that, that it's 5e for one player and one GM. And, you know, we would have to do quite a lot of rules work to, to make that happen. But it seemed like such a cool fit. So it was basically a, an ongoing conversation for maybe a couple of weeks where we were we were kicking around what what it was we could do and do well and that we wanted to do and and yeah we just kept coming back around to this kind of thing and and then that really snapped into sharp focus with the idea of of single player and and, and a gm and and that fitted really well with this sort of saga mythic hero you know singular hero mm -hmm. supported by a group of followers who are also controlled by the player um and yeah, it just seemed like a neat idea. You know, it seemed really good. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I've always pretty much always been a kind of Beowulf fan, I guess, or for, for a very long time. I mean, it's, it's something that's floated around in the background as part of, I used to, I was the sort of lead artist out on Games Workshop's Warhammer historical line. And we did a, a, a book called Shield Wall, very good supplement actually for, mm -hmm. for Warhammer historical um, and, and learning all about the Anglo-Saxons and so on for that. Yeah, was was really the start of it, which goes back a really long way. But 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 much more to do with studying Tolkien for for those games, which were pretty well thought of. Mm -hmm. Now, doing doing this doing this particular style of um of fa of fantasy. Now, for, first off, I will I will note that when I was looking at the when I was looking at the initial Kickstarter, and I do want to offer my congrats for how for how well that turned out. Oh, um I it's at the time I did not know that you that you that that um the people at Hand to Work Games including yourself had a background with um with the with the One Ring and Adve and Adventures mm. in Middle Earth um cuz the whole time the whole time I kept I kept making I kept making jokes saying <laughs> cuz I didn't I didn't know any better that yeah. th that um I kept that I kept getting Cubicle 7 vibes and the the two the two games that I kept getting reminded of when it came when it came to Cubicle Seven's output as I was going through it were um, the One Ring, which mm -hmm. I've co which I've covered in the past. I did a whole um, I did a whole month month um, set of reviews on um, Tolkien games, mm -hmm. um, and um, Lone and um, Lone Wolf, ah, the yeah. Lone the Lone Wolf that um, was done, that was done by C that was done by C Seven. Mm, not yeah. not to be confused with the one that was done by Mongoose, which is it's not it's not bad. It's just it's just it was it was during a it was during a time period where ev where everybody was doing a D twenty book. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the idea of doing duets 
is not is it's something that's been around for a while, but a game but a game or a setting that is actively built around it is something is something of a novelty. Did you guys have did you did you guys have experience with when it came to doing duet campaigns before this or was or was or was that something that you hadn't done as often um, leading up to this point? I think the, definitely some of the team had played. So Jacob Rogers is is one of the co-designers. Really, the the sort of design team, if you like, the rules design team was uh, Jacob Rogers, myself, and David Rea. Uh, now, both David and Jacob have played games with their kids, a one on one, uh, which often, you know, it's often the case, isn't it, where you want to kind of you want to play. A game of D and D. Jacob mm -hmm. certainly has played a lot with his son Wesley, who's in the who's in the credits. Uh, of, of he came up, added some stuff in the Beowulf, which is really cool. Um, and and yeah, Jacob certainly is very committed to to making games that are really accessible to younger players and 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 maybe to to people who don't have the full group experience, if you like, um, whether mm -hmm. it is parent and child or or um, you know playing with your significant other or stuff or, and so on so jacob definitely had experience with it. myself not so much um i've yeah i'm trying to think if i've ever played yeah oh years and years and years ago when i was at school i made up a single player single gm game which i've only just thought of now but yeah but that was it's not really relevant because <laughs> i've only just remembered that we even did it so no is the answer to that question i i certainly didn't have a lot of experience with that uh but some of the other members of the team did Mm -hmm. um, and, and had a lot. I mean, Jacob certainly has really switched. Well, David too, but they're both very switched on to sort of the needs of Five E and things like the action economy and all that. And they're they're the real experts on that stuff. And I defer to their expertise on on that kind of rule stuff. Yeah. Now, um, I remember I remember when the when when one of the when one of the um. Well, Scub um, film adaptations of Be of Beowulf came out. The the one that was done by the same guy who did um, the Polar Express, and oh, yeah. Yeah. would would later do would later do an adaptation of the Christmas Story that was was kind of a mixed bag. Um, I I remember go I remember go I remember um because I I was already familiar with the story of Beowulf, but I remember doing a deep doing a deep dive on a lot of the stuff that people. Even to this day, still argue about when it comes to the story. Mm -hmm. um, and when it came when it came to when it came to doing when it came to doing research and um, and dealing with the fact that there's multiple interpretations and translations of these of these story, um, was it a ch was it a challenge to try and co to try and codify all that? It kind of the good thing is we we haven't actually, and it's kind of interesting because I should talk about this with the team. We we've never tried to present the story of Beowulf as a scenario that you play, um, and it's kind of weird and interesting that really it's never occurred to us to do it. Uh, it's much more about being able to make up stories in the spirit of that story, and mm -hmm. so we sort of took apart, we kind of took slices through as many different versions as as we could get our hands on really and i've got a shelf full of different beowulf uh you know different translations and and, and novelizations and poems and so on mm -hmm. um, and and i think we, we i would pick out a few that were the real guiding lights for us which certainly would be tolkien's translation and seamus heaney and then latterly uh maria devana headley's really new translations mm -hmm. really good i think well worth picking up um and th those three were kind of our kind of guiding lights, I guess, and, and almost like an authority we look to for what it's all about. Um, there, was, there was an enormous amount in, in Tolkien's essays around Beowulf. There was a lot there where we thought, yeah, this this can can be folded into a role playing game. The stuff he talks about is sort of melancholic northern European spirit and so on. And this I mean, ideas that actually have since been refuted in some ways but i think when you're making a game that's that's about much more about poetry than history if you know what i mean uh that's it's fine you know it yeah. doesn't, doesn't matter if he was wrong um i think I, I gather now that the latest thoughts are that this sort of 
Northern European melancholic doom laden tradition that the world is doomed to be devoured by monsters is apparently much more of a Christian tradition. It's thought of now rather than the the precursor sort of heathen tradition. Uh, but I mean, this is all like up for debate, and people are debating it at the moment. And like it'll, as you rightly say, there's a lot of scholarly debate around this stuff. Um, look, if you get look if you get three if you get three scholars in a room, the only thing that they'll agree on is that one of them is wrong. Yeah, totally. I mean, it's and and I like that. Um, one one of the real joys of of making a role playing game is we don't we. I mean, it is quite scholarly in a way. Beowulf. There's a nice solid reading list in there. You know, if people want to delve into it. We took great pains to to make sure you don't really have to know anything about the history. You know, if you've watched a couple of episodes of like Vikings and you want to run a game that's about that sort of stuff, you can totally do it with Beowulf. It's really well set up for that. Um, uh, but but if you want to delve a bit deeper, it's, it, it can take that as well. And that was a real key sort of design goal for the setting was that it would play with just you are a lone hero with a ship and a crew and a band of followers. And you, you roam around, you know, the Baltic and the North Sea and you find mythic locations troubled by monsters. You hunt down those monsters and slay them. And that's kind of the, uh, uh, you know, rinse, wash, repeat kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the core loop of the of the play. Um, and you can you can hang a lot of stuff off that to make that you know quite interesting and have quite a lot of twists and turns along the way um but we we were able to really simplify down the themes of beowulf without being troubled too much by a scholarly approach because it's a fun game you know it's yes it's, it's it's a bit of entertainment which is good you know we, we take it very seriously um but it's yeah we we don't have to worry if there's yeah scholarly fallings out um now even when it comes to this when it, now when it comes to the style of fantasy that D, that d and d is that d and d is supposed to be it's for the mm. longest time it's it's rooted itself very firmly in the high, in the high end of the um mm. spectrum yeah um of course of course there of course there is the prop there is the problem of of the of d and d over the years not knowing whether to shit or get off the pot when it comes to what kind of fantasy it is but yep. that that's a that's a topic for an, that's a topic for another night but gi but given that and given the fact that um beowulf is very is very much on the lo on the lower end of the lower end of the fantastical um border borderline um sword and sorcery le levels of lower end um what are some what are some of the what are when adv when advising so when advising somebody who's making the shift from more traditional high fantasy over to the style of fantasy of Beowulf, what are some of the things that you typically advise them to unlearn? One of the big things that that straight away sort of leaps out is we do, we don't have any um, player spellcasters. Um, I, I really like that five e i think for me and i know people vociferously disagree with this point i think five e is quite well made and i think it fits together um it has these quite simple moving parts that fit together really well i think that enable you to take them apart and put them together in different ways which is very much what we've done um i was talking with another designer the other day who's working on a, a sort of vikingy kind of setting and he's really working really hard to bring the full sort of range of D&D &D experience to sort of translate that to a sort of Viking-y world. And it really struck me that we just didn't really bother with that. <laughs> we were quite bold in what we've just stripped out. Um, and I think 5e can handle that quite easily, actually. And there's a lot you can do that is very versatile. So, and I'm not answering your question at all in saying all of that. Um, that's the sort of background to it. So no 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 spell casting for for players uh no murder sort of hoboism is really not a thing in Beowulf you really are tied into the world as a hero who has responsibilities mm -hmm. um and and things like the way the economy works you while you do gain treasure and you can spend treasure on things it's a gift giving economy so you there's no shops to go to uh you it's very important that you give a lot of stuff away to your followers. So it's a very different experience. You are not, uh, in a weird kind of way, you're a lot less selfish. As you, every, every character within Beowulf Age of Heroes is a hero. The hero class, one class with six subclasses. You're all heroes. You're all considered to be, broadly speaking, good. 
we don't have align the traditional alignment system alignment is re is replaced your alignment is your uh, religious faith be that the old ways or christianity or what we call uh, um, the church just mm -hmm. to give it a little bit of a remove um so it's really about your attitude in the world in in a way probably the single thing you would that you would be best to unlearn is is you're not there to be selfish and accumulate wealth that that really won't cut it in beowulf um but you still need treasure to repair your ship and pay your followers and be seen as a as a, a gracious ring giver and keeping everyone loyal in your band and so on you'll do a lot more management a lot more people management than you will do in regular dnd &D. you have a lot more ties to the setting and you'll owe people things mm -hmm. and they will owe you things and that's uh, you know i think that's pretty interesting stuff yeah. and when now, when it came to when it came to the creation of a hero class, was um, did you did was did was it always going to be the case of just making one hero class, or were or were there several at first that you had that you had in mind that you just whittled down with um, time? Yeah, pretty much that. I think I think we started out assuming we would have several different classes, and through the process, I'm pretty sure this was david's idea that that actually we could just do a singular class that a single class that packed in a lot of common assumptions because because it was for a single player they needed certain things were going to be common to all the classes so that they could survive right mm -hmm. a certain amount of hit points a certain amount of ability to deal damage um because there are no other party members there to to occupy different specialized roles so that kind of commonality across what initially started out, I believe, as, as a bunch of different ideas for different classes, coalesced pretty quickly into, ah, but if we just did one class with subclasses, we can we can save a lot of ink almost. You know what I mean? In the book, we can just start everyone off at the same space in the same space, and then you can we made sure you can wildly diverge through the subclasses and your choices mm -hmm. um to to make unique heroes, but still have that that common base of of, of some some things that they're gonna need for it all to to work um i believe it was i mean it doesn't really matter whose idea it, things were uh but the whole six subclasses based around the attribute scores i, I take great delight in that because it's so old school um, it's um in a, in a weird way it, in a weird way that whole, having having these sub having these subclasses be rooted in um in the ability scores in a weird way reminds me of d20 modern right oh okay yeah yeah um, since that's basically what d20 modern did with its bit with its um base classes each i think it, yeah it gives you something really you can it, you can think of well for me at least if i think of say a strength hero or a dexterity based hero i can sort of immediately imagine characters based on mm. that and I think that's really important. I think it really, I can see why they did it in, in modern um, because it gives you, oh, we're, we're also working on another project that's uh, uh, sci-fi, dystopian sci-fi game called A-State. Mm -hmm. You'll hear more about that in the coming weeks. Um, but in that, it's been interesting in actually making artwork for characters who in a more modern setting or a sci-fi setting, you don't, Right, so so in traditional vanilla D and D, like a barbarian looks pretty much a certain way, right? And you can tell what their job is by how they look. But in more modern settings, that isn't the case, really. You can you can you know if you you can, you can spot some things about people in the modern world by the way they dress or whatever, but mm -hmm. nothing like as obvious as in vanilla D and D, where yeah. yeah, the cleric looks a certain way, right? And 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 so yeah, it's, it's interesting that that um, D twenty modern went that mm -hmm. way i think it makes a lot of sense for the same reason yeah and um now you also you also had created a set a set of um a set of ba a set of backgrounds for mm. it and was there an was there initial temptation to to just use the same backgrounds or at least a collection of the same backgrounds from core or what or um did you guys always always want to make a set of backgrounds specifically designed around um, that designed around Beowulf. Uh, I think it was always going to be our own backgrounds just to really bring those kind of archetypes in there. And again, it's sort of divorcing it a little bit from traditional play and mm -hmm. to, to, to give you that remove so that you 
you're encouraged to think perhaps a little bit differently about the world your character inhabits. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a, there's a lot, you can get a lot of setting. I mean, obviously, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir here, you can get a lot of setting into, into the things like backgrounds and, and classes and subclasses within, within 5e. Um, and I think it's really important to use those if you're trying to build a very specific play space, which we were. Mm -hmm. um, and I certainly don't think that's right for every single game or every single setting. But I think for this one, it's so, it's it's aimed at having such a specific tone um, that it that it needed that. Yeah. Now, with with that kind with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, mm -hmm. um, when it came to now, obvi obviously, there's a there's a handful of um, there. I be I believe you had. S you had also set up some, I get some op some optional rules, um, and w but one of the um, one of the things one of the things that I'm that I was curious about is when it comes to doing solo play, I mm -hmm. think the I think a big thing that has to that has to be drastically reexamined is encounter design. Right. Um so what I'm curious about is what is what were what were some of the things that you get that you guys um ended up lear ended up learning the easy way or hard way about how how you had to design encounters for modules in in this um setting. So something we wanted to keep as as a sort of early goal was that we didn't want it to be a massive learn for GMs coming to this, that they had to completely abandon things like challenge rating as, as they stand now. Now, okay, we could talk a lot about challenge rating and how it's slightly problematic in a number of areas, but as a broad sort of, you know, measuring tool, it has its definite uses. So we wanted, we almost wanted a Beowulf hero to function like the base assumptions that 5e is built on that you have a party of four characters each kind of doing a, a slightly different job mostly you know or they have a, sp a spread of abilities and they're going to have four actions basically around and monsters are going to you know each have their actions and reactions on. um and so that was the kind of guiding principle which brought us to followers which mm -hmm allows you to sort of navigate the because the, the the action economy in 5e is quite um inflexible is maybe a strong word so it's, it's significant right you could you could if you were just playing one regular character and three monsters attacked you in in regular D, &D they're just going to like beat you to the ground because they're just getting more goes than you right if they're you know if they're of a similar level obviously if, they, if you've got tons and tons of hit points for example or if you're dealing out way more damage than them we we didn't really want to go that route of making the hero almost uh, artificially strong. I mean, they are a little bit stronger. You give you a few more hit points um, just to get you through those early levels, but that levels off. Um, so followers give you more actions. Basically mm -hmm. followers can almost all followers that you will have with you uh, have the ability to tie up enemies for three rounds, basically while the hero works their way around the battlefield um and we were imagining like almost like an errol flynn movie where you see in the background there are sort of like a robin hood errol flynn thing and there will be merry men and normans just in the background like whacking their swords together and sort of as amusing as that is i think there's 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 parts in in kind of epic poetry from the from the period where battle happens in the background with a focus on the heroes and and when they choose to to make a difference in the battle that's what matters yeah um, and it's the actions of the heroes that matter so we needed something that was just going to tie up enemies mm -hmm. uh which followers that's one of their primary functions is that, that in each round they can they can tie up a foe and keep them from attacking the hero mm -hmm. um and we just kind of we that came pretty easy actually that that one ability for followers followers was probably the toughest single part to get right in the whole thing uh and and that that came pretty easy that part of it that, that if they just tie up monsters um, and keep them busy and occupied while the hero can fight one on one with with foes or yeah maybe maybe fight a couple at a time but 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 they're never going to get totally swarmed yeah um, that actually lets lets 
encounter designs stay relatively just the same. There's, there's not a huge, there isn't a huge learning curve for GMs. Um, obviously, it's, there's so much in 5e that depends on playstyle. We found. I mean, we we'd all worked on Adventures in Middle Earth as a, as a team, and, and there was a lot to learn there about how once that that was a really big project. Uh, and once that escaped into the wild, there was an enormous amount to learn from how people used it um, and how different people play games and, and the way they approach it that, that no rule set can really account for. Mm-hmm. Um, so we already had all that stuff under our belt, which was hugely helpful. Yeah. Now, one of the one of the thing one of the things I was cu- one of the things I was curious about when it comes to when it comes to some of the rule changes is um the is the introduction of the alignment die now mm. i've um when it comes to alignment as a whole i will admit that that's that's been one of those things that i either um min- i either minimize or or, re- or rejigger to be more of a to be more of a faction based approach instead of the yeah. law yeah. chaos thing cuz yeah. um what's that about you know my yeah. my approach when it comes to when it came to the whole good evil law chaos thing is that it works perfectly it works perfectly well if it's if it's used in its um more more cocky and intent. Um, mm-hmm. You yeah. have a pantheon of law, a pantheon of chaos, and it, and alignment determines which of those particular factions likes you more or less. Yeah. But when it became when that when that somehow with time got morphed into a morality system is when you start seeing problems. Mm-hmm. Um. And. From what I've seen, from what I've seen with the alignment system that you have, it's more, or ra- rather your equivalent, it has it's more it's more along the lines of, um, of religious affiliation. In that in that sense, instead instead of the law chaos thing, especially since, well, chaos would there's there's not there's not really that there's not really the traditional chaos appro- chaos approach that would fit within the, within this kind of setting. Yeah, because you're never going to be, uh, a, a, particularly as a hero, you're never going to be aligned with the sort of forces of chaos, as it were. Um, it, it, we absolutely got rid of the moral element. We d- we don't draw any moral difference, particularly between the old ways and the church. They each have aspects to them. You know, each has a sort of list of things they believe. And I hope they are both quite sympathetic while being different. That was the kind of idea because in the poem of Beowulf, you can see a people are sort of digesting the conversion to Christianity um, and, it, and, and sort of struggling with that and trying to put it into a context and in, in wider research around and reading around the historical Anglo-Saxons, mm-hmm. you can, there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. We absolutely did not want to, for obvious reasons, did not want to draw moral sides in that. And, and, I think we're all quite sympathetic to the fact that sort of good evil law chaos stuff is dare I say it fairly hokey in 2021. Uh, it, it's quite a strange sort of setup, I think in some ways, I mean, obviously I understand where it's come from and I've played games for years and years and years where we use that and quite enjoy it, you know, mm-hmm. but when you come to make something new, you're like, is this fit for purpose? No, it's not really. Um, and, and it was a nice, it was nice to just lift it straight out and it came out very, it comes out of 5e very cleanly. You can just remove that. It doesn't really impact very much. Uh, and it let us put something different in place, which which did did let us do a little bit more mechanically than perhaps traditional alignment can mm-hmm. do. Um, so yeah, yeah, the the alignment die stuff I think is, is pretty cool. Um, Again, something I was discussing this very day that a breakthrough on that was so so how basically the the alignment die works is you you have a die, yeah, yeah. when you roll with advantage, of course you're rolling two dice, mm-hmm. um, and if you one of them is your alignment die, one is just your regular d twenty. If you choose the result on your alignment die, even if it's succeed or fail, uh, you gain inspiration. Now, a big breakthrough we had was originally we we went through a lot of iterations of some sort of philosophical alignment that would try and replicate this, that the old ways have this doomed mentality that the the world is doomed to be destroyed by monsters as part of an unending cycle. Everyone is going to die. The only the only way to sort of survive is to be remembered and die a glorious death, that kind of thing. And of course, Christianity has this idea that that 
as long as you're sort of saved and you believe you don't die, you you go on into heaven, what have you. Um, and it's quite upbeat by comparison. You know, if everyone around you is, is absolutely convinced the world is going to die devoured by monsters, someone going, actually, it's not because God's on your side and cares about you. That's quite, you know, you can see why people were attracted to that idea in, you know, the fifth century, what have you. It's sort of a, fairly attractive in given the context. I mean, you know, we're, we're, we're talking a thousand years before the King James Bible. So this is a very different Christianity to the, to the Christianity of today, you know, and I certainly... There's very little point in in sort of talking about that in this context, mm -hmm. but um, the the breakthrough we had is is we realised we didn't need to replicate oh the the sort of the old ways the sort of heathen believes if you like the pagans if you like I mean some people don't like that term some people do um, I don't particularly draw a moral conclusion for it but but the followers of the old ways we wanted them to like if they take the doom choice then they get a, a benefit but then we realised the people of the followers of the church if they're in a sort of doomed situation well then their belief helps them out doesn't it you know they're in a dark place they're inspired by their faith uh, and we're like oh it's the same thing right it's the same it doesn't need to be a totally different way we we had loads of different iterations of this that when you roll ones or 20s and and had all this stuff that was it was quite cool on paper but when you actually played it you had to consult tables in the end it was like no this is it's cute but it's a darling that has to be got rid of and mm -hmm. and then jacob jacob came up with the system that it's you know you 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 which die you pick which physical die you pick when you roll your 2d20s matters based on your outlook in life and the fact you're a hero and that you have a destiny and you are favored by the the rulers of your philosophical system whether that's woden and his family or whether it's uh you know the god of the book so, mm -hmm. yeah so it's much more mechanically tied in to what goes on at the table than perhaps the the, the traditional alignment system. Yeah. And with now with with that with that kind of thing in mind, um, like when it when it comes to when it comes to followers, I do want I do want to I do want to touch on that for a bit because mm. the, because. Um, Obviously, 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 the idea of getting of getting minions has been a has been a staple in D, in D and D. Um, I was gonna say I was gonna say since day one, but what counts as day one is yeah. debatable. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah, hirelings and so on has always been a thing, though, hasn't it? More or less, well, more or less, always. But yeah. I ended up having this argument with with somebody last night. With somebody last night, but let's let's not forget that there is like five different versions of original D and D. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really <laughs> matter, does it, for the purposes of this this discussion? Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's been around for a long time. Yeah, but. You know. The but um a a issue that ends up cropping up especially w especially when in especially when individual followers have had their own in, have had their own initiative and actions throughout different games is making sure that it do that that management doesn't get bogged down too much yeah you've yeah. you've talked you've talked about you've talked about not wanting to not wanting to play completely raw all, raw all the time and how even though you may run a five e um campaign. It's it, that it, you are very, very much stretching the term, like ha to the point that it's the it's like having Reed Richards drawn and quartered. <laughs> um, <laughs> yep. So the so the question that I have in that is, when it comes to followers, how do you make it so that the GM isn't tracking way too much um, initiatives or wait or way too much things when it comes to um, followers? So they they are really reduced in in what they in in the way they appear in the rules, if you like. Mm -hmm. Followers in in Beowulf are pretty much like spells. Mm -hmm. They have uh, a follower will have a number of gifts, potentially a number of burdens. Uh, the gifts will generally include the the engage gift, which allows them to tie up monsters. They will generally have the rescue the hero gift which allows, should the hero fall to zero hit points, their followers will kind of close ranks around them, drag them out of the um, situation in a sort of fighting retreat, and then they all have to make death saves because some of them will stand a good chance of dying to, to rescue the hero. Mm -hmm. um, which, again, another problem with, with duet play, right? If you if you go below or to zero hit points, you, you're you in trouble if there's only one of you because you have nobody to save you and 
pour a potion down your neck. Um, so they they are very, very stripped back. They don't have even their own stat block. They don't have like a monster stat block. They operate, they don't have bonuses in general. Sometimes I do believe we have a couple of um, gifts that, that might give them advantage on certain roles, but mm -hmm. that's very specific to key gifts. Um, and it's about a, a key design thing was keeping them as simple as possible while doing what they need to do to make the thing run. So they don't have hit points. Um, they, yeah, they, there is almost nothing to track really. You, you, you will need to track the, the fact that if they're engaging monsters, that they, they do so for three rounds. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's relatively, we've, you know, obviously we've played a lot of Beowulf. I mean, in, in my games that I play, that's completely different thing to Beowulf as written. If you know what I mean, my, I'm loosey goosey terrible mm -hmm. player of proper games beowulf is not written in that style i have uh very very good co-designers who play games properly unlike me um and that's why i mostly handle the setting because <laughs> <laughs> oh. well that's what i'm good at right and they're very good at knowing the rules properly uh but the, but the key point is is followers are incredibly stripped back in in mm -hmm. what they can do and they don't have lots of details for it because it was interesting while we were in the middle of development um wizards announced that they were doing a thing with how to play dnd &D on your own because it's a good idea well, not on your own but yeah with one gm one player it's a good idea mm -hmm. and we were like oh no you know we're, they're going to come to the same conclusions as us we're going to look like we're copying them we're going to uh have overstepped the open game license because if we duplicate anything they've done and actually as it turned out it's completely different they're 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 kind of companions what's it called can't remember I don't think it's followers uh but they, they have stat blocks and so on and we mm -hmm. breathed a, a heavy sigh of relief because we, we were like phew we didn't go that way yeah um so it's it's very simple and speaking of, speaking on the um on the on the setting uh, material mm. um on the on the world it's on the world itself um when it came when it came to when it came when it came to how you how you set how you set it how you set it up, um, were there were there any um were there any se were there any setting ha were there any setting habits that you, that you felt you had to po you had to point out so that people don't fall into those traps? Because one of the things that one of the sidebars that I saw that gave me a bit of a chuckle as I was going through it is the no ends thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and this is still an ongoing, there's an ongoing struggle internally about that kind of things because no ins kind of stands for a lot of things, no shops, very little division of labor, you know. So there isn't the the number of people who have a very specific job is quite low. Most people within the setting are sort of warriors and farmers. You know, the the, the historical Anglo Saxons when they moved to the British Isles. Do not immediately take over the, the the abandoned Roman infrastructure. They don't live that way. They live sort of in the countryside on farms, you know. Mm -hmm. And and well, good on them. That's an aspirational thing to do in in modern times, right? To to own land and be a a, a farmer or you know self sufficient and so on is is something generally more rich people like to do. Uh, so. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's, there are some assumptions that you, you you may have to get rid of. The fact you can go to shops, there are no shops where you can just go and buy things. Uh, a key part of the setting is that, yeah, no inns is about the fact the center of every settlement is the, the lord or lady's mead hall, mm -hmm. where the leader of the community really at a basic level controls the supply of drink. That's why it's the mead hall. Sure, it's the, the sort of feasting center, and it's the it's the glue that binds everyone together, and and where you can find the, the community leader if you need their help or their instruction, or you want sort of justice to be dispensed. But it's called the mead hall partly because the 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 local ruler doles out the drink and everything else at their own kind of. They're seen to be very generous with with how they distribute mm. both gifts, wealth work favor patronage but but very importantly you know booze um so you can't go to a shop and buy effectively a bed for the night and and a pint of ale it, it, it doesn't exist and this is another thing that really ties characters into the settings we see it in the beowulf poem that when you turn up 
as a group of armed people, you really have to announce who you are and what your intentions are. Because, you know, the local, these are all little fiefdoms of sort of run by warlords. It doesn't take much to be a king in this mm -hmm. setting. Um, if you've got a body of troops, you know, well, that's you. you you're a king. You raise a hall. You tell everyone's got to pay you their taxes and you dole out, you know, as you see fit. Um, and so that, yeah, that is really quite different, but it, it all really helps support the structure of the adventures. It's all tied together. Um, and, and, you know, the way characters work and mm -hmm. so on, the way heroes move around the world uh, and, and what treasure is and what it's for yeah. and so on is, all, is yeah. very much tied into this setting. So, yeah, no ends. We fight very hard not to use the term village because that's a bit of a later kind of Norman sort of French word village. Mm -hmm. they're, they're settlements. They're, they're, they're settlements that grow up around, spring up around a mead hall. Yeah. Now, with... The Given how, given how you mentioned that um, that there's a very there's a very gift based um, setup, mm -hmm. um, that brings that brings me to an it to an, to a very common trap for yeah, for um, D, for DMs of all, of all ages, and that and it's one it's one term that you're, that you're going to be of the right age to get this gag, and that is the Monty Hall. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> um. How and for and for those for those unaware, uh, Monty the Monty Hall, aside from being a reference to the former host of Let's Make a Deal, is in in reference to GMs that tend to be get, that tend to give treasure or magic items or the like um, a, a little bit too liberally to um, players. Um, it's generally seen it seen as a bad idea, but. When it comes to the, when it comes to this gift based approach with a, with acquisition, what steps do you make? Sh what steps do you guys do to make to kind of discourage a the uh, Monty Hall trap? So it something that all heroes have because you have this band of followers, mm -hmm. uh, and it's within this setting of a gift giving economy. You, it, it's not the case that it's only the hero being given gifts. The hero is expected to give gifts to their followers. So at the end of every adventure, it's pretty likely you will have come across some treasure. And in fact, it would be disastrous for the hero if they had not come across some treasure or been rewarded with gifts. And we, we measure treasure in pounds of silver so that basically any, any amount of any stuff can be, can be considered in pounds of silver. The hero then has bills to pay effectively in that they have to give gifts to their followers. Now, each follower has to be rewarded in line with their ability so they they need certain amount of pounds of silver for every gift they have now also you've got the issue that if some followers have a lot more gifts and some have a lot less you're going to need to make up the pay of the followers or the gifts i should say really mm -hmm. the gifts to the less experienced followers need to be within a spitting distance as it were of the best paid because otherwise they're going to get annoyed that why is you know knut getting you know, five pounds of silver and I'm only getting one pound of silver and I'm still, you know, hauling you out of the monster's den, you know. So you're going to have to make up, there can't be too big a pay gap within your followers. Otherwise, they start getting burdened. They start becoming sullen or, uh, you know, they're uncooperative and they won't always do what you ask them to. And you might have to make roles to get them to use their abilities if they become sullen. So basically, there's bills to pay. You also have the upkeep of your ship. Every hero has a ship just as by default, uh, because you need it to get around the setting because it's all points of light around the edge of the whale road, around the ocean, the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. And you have to have a ship to get around. Mm -hmm. And the ship requires money to be restocked. You have to pay your crew. The crew of the ship are a little bit like the engine. We don't trouble ourselves too much with them because mm -hmm. that would be too much bookkeeping. Uh, you can you can find replacement sailors everywhere. Uh, and, and, you know, you do if you've lost any sailors through various things that have happened, you can replace them quite easily, but they all need paid. So there is a constant drain on the resources of your hero. Mm -hmm. And it's almost, there's a, there's an interesting sort of, it's cool when you first play a couple of games and, and, and the hero finds himself with a bunch of treasure. And then they're quite usually the players, this, this happens with new players. I've seen this over and over where they're like, wow, I've got this treasure. And I'm like, right. Yeah. Yeah. Giving out gifts. This is brilliant. And so I give gifts all, and people, we, we find people, we wanted people to sort of bond with their follower NPCs and it's worked 
way more than we thought it would people really love their follower group and they're giving treasure to them and they feel really good about it but but then they start running a bit short and and you know they've got to maintain the ship and so on now generally i, I would advise gms in early adventures in a bail campaign don't worry too much about giving too much treasure away because they're gonna see it be whittled down really quickly and and they're not necessarily it, it would be quite unusual to you would have to really go for it to give them twice what they need. Mm -hmm. So they're going to pay out more than half of their reserves of treasure at the end of most adventures. And so they're going to need to do another adventure because if they build up the abilities of their followers, which happens in downtime, they realize their bills are going up. And if they want to improve their ship, the bills are going up. The, the upkeep becomes higher and higher. So there's a drive to keep, you know, seeking out treasure. Uh, it would be, a rare hero who would see it quite in such mercenary terms, but we've certainly got pre-generated characters who definitely see it in those terms that they're, it's almost like a business, you know, that they, they have to keep things turning over. So it's good that there are by moving away from that, that role of adventurers in, in a more regular D and D campaign that don't really have a lot of outgoings. Um, they, they can am amass a lot of treasure mm -hmm. without any consequence really. But but in Beowulf, the hero has a lot of bills to pay. Yeah. Um, and it, and yeah. when it comes to that, um, how how do you how do you make sure that that is, that that isn't too bookkeepy, too too uh, busy worky? Because because everything's in pounds of treasure, and we've kept the maths as simple as possible. So you know, book, I, I'll probably get this wrong because we change some stuff to make it more simple at the end. But you're pretty much paying out a pound of treasure to upkeep the ship. I think it might be two now. Um, and, you know, one pound per follower. It's very easy math to just, you can eyeball what your outgoings are by just looking at your, we, we provide follower cards that have each of the the uh, gifts that your followers got written out on them. So you can reference them very easily in play. And you can just, you can eyeball your total treasure outgoings. Um, so it's all very, very simple maths. And I mean, I'm afraid that's me. I'm a massive fan of simple maths. Um, cause I think it, it, it's rare that having very granular mass adds much to my play experience. I have to say, um, well, that, that end you, um, you're, you've prop, you've prob you've, prob you've probably had at least one experience when it comes to doing the math for a vehicle in GURPS. Yeah. Well, I'm, trying to think of what's the, I'm trying to think of a game cause I've definitely sat at a table. I'm trying to think what it was we were playing. I would have been thinking where you're just like, Oh, I, I just, Oh, I don't want to say the name of. I know what game it was that we play tested an adventure for a particular D twenty adaptation. I don't want to say what it was because I like the guy who designed it. But in, and it's totally on me that I looked at all the bookkeeping we had to do, and I was just like, I don't really care. Can someone else do it? Because I spend my money sensibly, ending up with a sort of median outcome. <laughs> I have I have a sizable collection of get. If someone were to look at the reviews of games that I've done, they've done, they've, mm -hmm. they'd probably see that a lot of them are fairly recent, um, right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that there was a period of time. I want to, I want to say, I want to say mid eight. I want to say mid eighties through mid through mid to late night through um, I'd say through I'd say early to mid nineties, where. A lot of the a lot of designers were trying to make their games as granular as de as detailed as as humanly possible. Yeah, it was like the thing to do, wasn't it? It was like more is better, you know. For, for, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, and I'm not I'm not saying that I'm not saying that granularity is is an issue. It becomes an issue when there's a bunch when there's a few things that get used a lot and a bunch and a bunch of stuff that's in there that isn't getting used. Yeah. Um, I like the idea that, say, say to use Beowulf as an example, because it's the forefront of my mind, I like that if you have a limited pool of treasure, you're going to have to make some choices between what you keep for your character to, to you know, be rich, if you like, um, which comes with benefits, you know, or you may want to buy equipment for your character or sort of move in circles that ensures you get given the good stuff. Uh, so you'd need to be rich for that to happen. Um that that's one choice then then obviously you're going to want a follower band who are loyal and think you're really brilliant because you give them lots of money 
<laughs> and 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 that's the expectation within the culture right they give you their military service if you like and you give them gifts that's the understanding and it's a two-way street and if anyone breaks either side of that bargain they're a bad person that that's the i mean this is all detailed in our second chapter that's almost like the measure of a bad person is they don't give fealty in return for gifts and they don't give gifts in return for fealty this is the measure of a good person um mm -hmm. oh, you know this is from beowulf um and, uh, but they also have the ship as well and there's loads of options to to improve your ship and, and upgrade your ship and those choices i think are interesting because each one has a sort of impact on play and where you're going to allot your sort of poker chips if you like is to me interesting and impactful and and i think most people are probably going to try and spread it fairly evenly but then their ship runs in some rocks and and you know then you're in trouble because you're gonna have to fix the ship and you're gonna have to explain to your followers why it's not a good year for bonuses um and it's all cool you know i think that's really really good but it's we try and keep the the numbers as, as manageable as possible in terms of simple maths i had uh, very early on actually this is an interesting sort of formative experience uh, uh i designed a rule set for live action role play which which mm -hmm. I always used to be a bit of ashamed of all that dressing up and running around in the woods because it's not necessarily popular with everyone. And it is, there is a level of ridiculousness to it, which I now find brilliant. It's so good. Um, but uh, uh, the rules need to be playable without pen and paper or, or reference or anything. You're just playing them live, person to person. And that was actually really informative, I think, for, for doing more design work you also when we were 18 we were running a live action role play club for money which terrifies me now every two weeks we used to put on two three hour adventures and people paid money to play them which gosh you know the arrogance of youth that would terrify me now that that it was almost like putting on a stage play you know two stage plays every two weeks and we had to write the adventures and and i mean people used to phone up there's no internet in those days people would phone us and book a place and pay their money so this was good discipline early on but as part of designing a rule system for one of those games we had i don't know what it was, it was some like xp system or something and it was all in multiples of five you know you got five or ten and skills cost five or ten whatever mm -hmm. uh, and someone just said to me why don't you just divide it all by five and i felt like such a fool at the time <laughs> Where you go, oh yeah, and and I always look for that sort of thing now. Ever since then, we go, can we div can we simplify this and it be the same? If you know what I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and it, it has the same, the same granularity, but with easier maths. Is always that's the gold standard as far as I'm concerned. You know, and I know I know some people like big numbers, and and I think for the right setting, it could be awesome to be dealing in millions of dollars or something. But but if you're dealing with millions of dollars and tens of thousands of dollars in the same exchanges it starts to get pretty tiresome i think sorry to anyone listening who just really likes maths and uh, <laughs> look it look there's a, um the policy that i have here in the temple is that is that there's that there's all types of games all types of play styles and we take the piss out of all of them yeah good yeah so we should oh um, well yeah it's it's a funny one it's not it's not my cup of tea to have to do loads of bookkeeping um and and i just forget things do, do you know what i mean i'm not it's not the thing that i'm really engaged in mm -hmm. so yeah i i really like the idea that the player and the gm almost share control of this group of npcs that are followers and they need to be paid and they have names if you like and mm -hmm. and their abilities are all names and their rules rather than number sort of they're not number things if you like and uh, yeah that's very much the style we're going for i think yeah i can i can certainly get i can certainly get behind that that kind of thing um with that with that said what is the future what is the future hold for both beowulf and um handiwork so yeah we're interesting times actually so the Physical books of Beowulf have been significantly caught up in this whole global pandemic, global shipping crisis thing. Uh, it has almost been the death of me. It's been incredibly stressful to get every get the wheels in line on getting these books to people. The great thing is people have had the PDF uh, since the beginning of the year. They know it's completed. I mean, this is as a Kickstarter creator, you live in terror of just failing do you know what i mean and disappointing people but the game is real 
it's printed for a little while it's been stuck in a warehouse in germany while we wrestled things like the global shortage of heat treated pallets that are necessary to transport goods for example to the u.s because the u.s quite sensibly does not want bugs in the pallets coming in but who knew you know uh, that, that this was a necessity and or that there was a global shortage of them but we're, we're there now things are moving which is great so uh people will be getting those books i mean some people have already got their books if you live in the eu you're very lucky if you you could have your book the only other person in the world with one is me um <laughs> but there are hundreds and hundreds if not in fact thousands of these things now moving around the world so that that's a big relief now while we've been doing all that we've also uh, back as unlocked five pdf adventures that, that are sent to them at no cost we mm-hmm. sort of tested the war on this we're going to print those in a book so there will be a an adventure supplement uh which will hit kickstarter at some point mm-hmm. um and i think that will be a really really nice book and it will also allow people to jump on board beowulf as a bit more of a mature line um and and they'll be able to get some really cool stuff that we've already made we've got our beowulf dice uh miniatures all this really really nice inspiration tokens we made with our friends at campaign coins and so on so that'll all be coming back so people can get a load of that stuff which will be great um before that we have i mentioned earlier on um the dystopian sci-fi game a state which Mm -hmm. uses the forged in the dark rules which is quite a departure from the 5e stuff i'm one of these weird people i like all kinds of games when i was doing art join the club (laughs) yeah i mean what's wrong with that i don't get it people get really cross or i i I literally had a bunch of messages i was posting some i think it was artwork from no it was photos of of when beowulf arrived i was posting posting on the imager community and i had more than one person write to me going oh it looks really great but why did you have to use 5e and then tried to sell me on sort of indie games i'm like look like I, I've worked on some really brilliant indie games while I was working on D and D third edition, and I like all of it. And if I want to play D and D, I want to play D and D. And sometimes it's fun to like kick dungeon doors down and stab orcs and take their money for the sake of it. It's good fun, right? But also other times, you know, we play Dust Devils, Matt Schneider. That's dating me a little bit there, but you know, some of Ron Edwards' not games. Not as much today. as you think. I'm familiar with Dust um, Devils. Dust Devils is really good. Wow, Dust Devils blew my mind. Really good. Um, yeah, wow. Uh, really, sort of. That's a game I'm really proud to have been involved in, and and it's so good. I think. But 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 I also like D and I don't, I don't know. I just I, I I'm a sort of some sort of weird simpleton idiot savant. I, don't um, know. I, I liked lots of stuff. So yeah, um, A State is is much more indie in its approach. Um, it was a we're doing the second edition of the game, the first edition of the game came out in the early 2000s where there was a yeah. bit of a there was a bit of a sort of brit indie invasion of the of the indie scene and and a state was one of those games it was the first game released by a company called contested ground studios which mm-hmm. was made up of a guy called paul Bourne, who now works for us at handiwork games he is an absolutely brilliant graphic artist and and layout artist really nice bloke as well um he he did all the layout for things like the one ring and so on and, and he moved on from cubicle seven when when i moved on too um and he he was one of the co-creators of a state the other the other creator is a guy called malcolm craig who also made a game called cold city and another game called hot war um but a state was his first game and i think malcolm has always wanted to revisit it it, it has that the system had that kind of first game trouble where I don't think it's as bad as as uh, Malcolm thinks it is, but we. An artist is their own worst critic. Yeah, totally. Uh, but it was a very traditional system, and there was a lot more that could be done. And Forged in the Dark provides a really great basis for collaboratively creating. The game is set in in an, a sort of endless city called mm-hmm. the City, and you are uh, all troublemakers. Basically, is the name of your of sort of adventurers if you like Mm -hmm. uh and and you work together to define your corner of the city what help it needs to become a better place for people to live in who are the enemies of the people that live there and and the challenges to them and you figure it all out and then you play through um some stories together where your characters work together to make the world a better place basically your small corner of the world um and i mean that's coming together really beautifully uh there's a free uh preview and setting primer um, that's on drive through 
Um, so that'll be our next thing. And as soon as we have enough Beowulf books in people's hands, that will hit Kickstarter. So uh, as soon as we know a date for that, that will be broadcast far and wide. Uh, what else are we doing? I'm going to do another round of map tiles. I make John John Hodgson, the imaginatively titled John Hodgson map tiles, which are map tiles made by me, John Hodgson. Um, and we've got a few of those in the can. We did We did, started out really with a Kickstarter for map tiles that I thought might make 500 pounds. And it made, how much did the first one make? 18,000, I think, which was like a bit shocking. And so we did another one and it made a little bit more money. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll be doing Map Tiles 3 at some point. Uh, and all kinds of stuff. We've got the, There are projects stretching into the distance, actually, and it's all quite exciting, mm-hmm. I have to say. Um, yep. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, certainly be lo- I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing, ha- to seeing how that kind of thing develops and the, and the, um, the shenanigans that are, that are inevitable when you, whenever you're getting the dice gods involved because the mantra we have here in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Gosh, ain't that the truth. <laughs> in fact, in fact, they're a, they're a, I consider them a, mo- I consider them a model for equality because it doesn't, it does not matter your age, race, gender, gender orientation. Um, the dice gods hate you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We've all, it's the sort of common experience that unites us all where we all have huge dreams for our, our characters or our campaigns. And then you start rolling dice and you go, Oh, it's like that. Is it? Even though I'm really great at this thing that I'm rolling dice on, mm-hmm. I, I seem to just be forced into the role of, absolute fool again so yeah oh i'll tell you another project we're doing that's going to be very exciting that isn't announced yet we are working behind the scenes with nightfall games who makes lay industries mm-hmm. on a, a project in collaboration with them uh and i've already said more than i should in saying that um i had some fun recently i just wrote a scenario for their terminator rpg which was yeah. good i'll be interested to see what they think of my scenario because i think it's slightly challenging the whole model but I may just get to rewrite it entirely yeah. into a more sensible format. Yeah. We shall see. Well, in lo- in lieu of jinxing, mm. yeah. Um, but w- with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come to come all the way to the temple and enjoy the insanity at play here. I very much enjoyed it. Thank you for inviting me. It's mm. good and yeah, nice to talk. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. Thank As I often much. say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> but it helps. Hmm. You don't have to be drunk to work here. <laughs> yep. And of and of course, a sincere thanks um, to at, to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come come on and visit the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>